Okay. Hi everyone. I'm hope I hope you are doing well. I'm using the co-president of Biosoc. Thank you very much for joining us for our seventh talk of the year. We would first like to thank our first corporate sponsor of the year, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an, an early stage genome editing company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenomics-based therapies, as well as providing educational resources. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Daniel Blumstein as our speaker. Professor Blumstein is a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at UCLA and UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. He co-directs UCLA's Evolutionary Medicine Program and also has studied animal behavior and conservation biology in multiple countries across the globe. He is also the author of seven books, most recently, The Nature of Fear, Survival Lessons from the Wild, and over 400 scholarly publications. A major thrust of, thrust of his research works to integrate different fields and apply ecological, ev evolutionary, and behavioral principles to applied questions. This talk will be followed by a Q&A session. So um, we are mainly talk so we will be taking questions on YouTube and also on Zoom link. So um, actually we, uh, Professor Blumstein really would like to have a discussion after the talk. So if you are now watching on YouTube um, and you can send us, uh, if we have, uh, we, can, we will post a Zoom link on the comment section. Uh, also you can join um, us, you can send us a message on social media if you, didn't receive the Zoom link or whatever. So um, without further ado, I would now welcome Dr. Blumstein to um, deliver his talk. Thank you. Thanks for having me and thanks everyone who is um, attending this talk. Today, what I wanna do is I want to share research um, that my colleagues and friends, um, Mike Letnick and Catherine Mosby and I have been doing for, um, well, we're on our third round of, of grant funding now. Um, and it's, um, kind of, I think, pretty innovative conservation science. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand and address the problem of restoring Australia's um, extinct or rapidly declining species uh, by allowing them to live with predators. And I'll tell you why that's important in a moment. Now, what I'm really interested in is what I'll call translational wildlife research. And in the US, the National Institute of Health has sort of a bench to bedside philosophy where um, bench research is designed to have an outcome. Um, so when I would think about translational wildlife research, I, I really am saying research that takes the fundamental insights from behavioral biology and ultimately applies them to wildlife conservation and management. And when I say wildlife conservation, I'm really talking about we have too few of something we want more of when I say wildlife management, we have too many of, we perceive we have too many of something that maybe we want less of. Now, a theme of all of this is mechanistic studies that will allow us to predict how animals will respond to anthropogenic assaults. And I've written a primer on conservation behavior before, and a lot of this is also applicable to managing ecotourism, which until the COVID pandemic, um, travel and tourism was one of the biggest industries in the globe, and ecotourism and urbanization are thrusting, making animals contact humans, and we need to understand how and why they respond to humans. A theme of all of this, and, um, and, and, and I think what you'll see in our, in our whole process of doing this, is that evidence-based um, decision-making is the key to developing effective conservation and management outcomes. Now, the way we do um, evidence-based decision-making is ultimately we do adaptive management. And there are two flavors of adaptive management out there. One is what we'll call active adaptive management. Management plans are modified based on the results of well-designed experiments that collect data on factors or variables that are demonstrably important for conservation or management. When you're dealing with endangered species, often you have, not always, um, but often you have very few individuals and every individual is, 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 is sacred. And then you have a problem because active adapt adaptive management implies you're doing experiments with proper controls and controls are really important. Sometimes we do passive adaptive management. Managers use historical data or data from uncontrolled experiments to come up with best guess management recommendations, the fate of which may be studied. So I think it's really important 
to evaluate ideas and see if they work. And then ultimately, again, parallel to sort of a biomedical model, um, think about how um, we can look at comparative effectiveness evaluation. In other words, not simply does something work better than a control or better than a placebo, but you know, is it much better? Is it worth the extra effort? And when I think about conservation behavior, I, I think that's the way we should be thinking about a lot of these questions. What's anti-predator behavior and why am I thinking about anti-predator behavior? Anti-predator behavior are a suite of things animals do to reduce the probability of being detected by a predator, attacked by a predator, or killed by a predator. It includes a variety of adaptations to detect predators, to identify them, anti-predator vigilance, escape from them, flee them, use refugia, or communicate about them. Why should we be interested in any predator behavior? Well, because there are direct effects of predation on populations and communities. Predation is a strong selective force that influences habitat selection and population persistence. In the yellow-bellied marmots I study in Colorado, we've now been studying this population for 59 consecutive years. We know that marmots persist in areas, meaning colonies don't go extinct in areas of good visibility and protective rocks. And, and this is because um, of the, 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 the pressure that predators um, exert over the long run. There are a variety of indirect effects of predation risk in populations and communities. Fear alone may influence where animals go and what they may do. Fear alone may structure communities. And in the context of conservation, predation often is implicated in wildlife management failures. So what I'll be talking a lot about today is how do we translocate or reintroduce animals, move them from one location to another because we want to restore a population or move them from captivity back into the wild. Many of these fail because of predation. So if predation is a cause of these important failures of, of a conservation management plan, then we need to understand something about any predator behavior. Shifting to Australia, which is really the subject for the rest of our talk, Australia is a good place to study this um, because depressingly, it has the worst record of recent mammalian extinctions. Depending upon how you count, 27 mammals have gone extinct since European settlement in 1788. 38% um, of the mammals that have gone extinct globally have done so in Australia. It's a, I would say hotbed, but really it's a cesspool of extinction. Um, and this is um, in large part because of introduced um, novel predators. Uh, Europeans brought foxes and cats and feral foxes and feral cats kill an estimated 75 million native animals each night. Not just mammals, but lizards and, and birds and other things. So, you know, people have been trying to kill these animals and we can talk later about the ethics of killing um, predators. Um, I have a real problem about killing wolves in North America. But I think the context in Australia is quite different. Um, the, there is a, a large endemic fauna in Australia, meaning these species are found nowhere else on Earth. And two introduced species have been having a disproportionate effect on this endemic fauna. So people have been doing continental-wide poisoning, basically, of, of, of foxes but, and, and shooting and trying to poison cats. But you really can't kill your way out of this one. Um, so people have introduced the idea of let's build fence reserves. Let's um, take predator susceptible species and put them inside fences that keep out cats and foxes. And, you know, so there's been a lot of design into coming up with a, a fence that works against cats and foxes. Um, and this has been very useful in recovering populations, at least in the mainland, of brush-tailed bedongs, burrowing bedongs, stick nest rats, rufous hair wallabies, um, western barred bandicoots, and, and, and other species as well. Now it turns out that um, when you fence an area, you also have smaller animals just start appearing. So you start having mice and other things um, start appearing in these areas too. And it's the smallest animals, which um, people refer to as a critical weight range, are the most vulnerable to predation and the most helped by fencing. So if you look at our recovery where I work, which I'll introduce you to a moment, you see kangaroos and rabbits outside the fence, but you see these other animals inside the fence. But the problems when you put up uh, exclosures, it's a barrier to dispersal. Um, it leads to overpopulation and overgrazing unless you're controlling these endangered species. 
um, it can lead to inbreeding and a loss of genetic diversity. And importantly, it sort of acts at the exact opposite way that you want to be going. It can breed tame and predator naive animals. In a recent paper, a recent review, some colleagues and I did that we published a couple um, months ago in PLOS Biology, turns out bringing animals in captivity leads to the same sorts of effects that bringing that the, the domesticating animals does, but it takes a little longer. So we're essentially implicitly um, domesticating animals, making them tame and predator naive when we bring them into predator free um, enclosures. So life is hard outside the fence. And ultimately what we really wanna do is we wanna get populations existing outside the fence, but there's a litany of failed reintroductions. Um, in the Western, Western Australia, Gibson deserts, bedongs and golden bandicoots when released outside fences were all killed by predators. Uh, New South Wales, Woylies were, um, were killed by predators when put outside the fence. The South Australia Flinders ranges, Woylies failed reintroduction. Um, at our recovery, bedongs and bilbies fail when put outside the fence. In Scotia, a fence reserve in New South Wales, male-tailed wallabies did not survive when put outside um, the fence. In Western Australia and Lorna Glen, golden bandicoots didn't survive. And failure comes about for a couple of reasons. One, there's maybe high predator density outside fence and also predator naivety. So there may be a failure to recognize predators and or there may be inappropriate responses or animals may be outgunned. They're just, you know, they, don't, they haven't evolved the ability to respond to these novel predators or there are too many of them. So broadly, you can view this as evolutionary um, uh, failures. There's an uh, absence of co-evolution with, with potentially novel predators or maybe developmental ontogenetic um, isolation from predators during a lifetime has led to increased vulnerability. Alex Carthy, a friend and colleague of mine uh, and I wrote a review in Tree where we really thought about these different mechanisms and the how this might influence cue discrimination and the ability to recognize and discriminate among predators. And Alex was on sort of a, a research leave hanging out of my lab and we talked a lot and then she sort of disappeared and came back with a, um, you know, we're writing things on the board and then she sort of came up with this like railroad, you know, subway map, which just beautifully illustrates everything we were talking about. But, you know, evolutionary uh, and ecological um, experience, you know, will lead to cue discrimination. But if, you know, maybe you don't have experience of some sort, then you end up getting um, no cue discrimination. And then we sort of thought about the concept, the, the, the outcomes of cue discrimination for, um, you know, what's going to happen when we try to maybe reintroduce animals into the wild or hope that they'll live in the wild. And the answer is, you know, some animals living under some experiences will do pretty well, but um, some animals are going to need a lot of help. So in response to this, colleagues and I and others have, have um, tried to train predators to respond to predators. Uh, I'm sorry, train prey to respond to predators. So many species have what might be called innate responses to predators. They innately, meaning the first time they need to respond to something, they respond to it. But also that doesn't mean that further experience with predators hones their um, ability. Other species have to learn to respond to predators through associated learning. So years ago, Andrea Griffin and I and Chris Evans um, demonstrated that we could train tamar wallabies to be more responsive to foxes with which they did not evolve with, but not goats. Foxes have an archetypical predator phenotype, whereas goats don't. And then Andrea went on and demonstrated that this could be socially transmitted to um, other tamar wallabies. You train demonstrators and then other wallabies can learn from this. And that's great um, if it works when you release them outside um, in predator rich areas. But it also is a lot of work and not all of this has worked. So simulated predator training may not increase survival with exotic predators. Um, sometimes this is because uh, or it's hypothesized the failures are because it's kind of arbitrary what people are using to train things. Maybe they're shooting rubber bands at them or squirting, um, you know, water or using, um, you know, completely phony models or um, expo you know, harassing animals in various ways that, that might lead to associative learning, but it doesn't really inculcate the necessary anti-predator behavioral responses that might be necessary. So Catherine Mosby, 
cold emailed me one day and said, I don't think any predator training works, here's why. And we ended up um, talking about this for a while online. And then she said, I think there's a better way. I think we need to throw in our endangered species in with predators and let, let the animals figure it out themselves. And if natural selection happens, meaning if your endangered species get killed by predators, um, you know, I think that's fine, she said. And if, um, you know, they learn, that's great. But the survivors of this, um, you know, uh, uh, experience would, might be better to reintroduce. And I said, I think that's unethical. And then we argued about it for a month. And this ultimately led to um, sort of a perspective where um, we proposed that um, we can harness natural selection, but also learning um, to what we call in situ predator training to allow animals to either um, learn themselves or be selected if they can't don't have the abilities to respond by exposing animals to low densities of predators over long periods of time. Now, clearly this isn't gonna work for all species. If you're down to five species on earth, the last thing you wanna do is put them in with predators. But what's really interesting in the Australian context is in some cases you have populations on offshore islands that are doing well because introduced predators haven't gotten there. But on the mainland Australia, you've got local extinction. So you can bring animals back. You have lots of them in this, these reserve populations. You can put them in predator-free areas. They breed um, up and then you have lots of these animals and then you can potentially do stuff like this. So this I'm not suggesting is a one size fits all strategy, but in some contexts, it might be worth considering. So we wanted to evaluate whether this works or doesn't work. <clears throat> Our cast of characters included initially feral cats, burrowing bedongs and greater bilbies. Um, burrowing bedongs are the largest of the bedong species. They're mostly herbivorous. They're the only macropoded to inhabit burrows. Um, individuals use multiple warrens and they have warren fidelity. They're pretty social. Um, they can breed throughout the year. They have a short gestation period and um, they live three or so years in, in the wild. Um, burrowing bedongs were extirpated on mainland Australia but were found on a variety of offshore Western Australia islands in good populations. So extinct on the mainland, doing okay on offshore predator-free islands. Greater bilbies um, are a little smaller. They're kind of rugby ball sized. Um, they're solitary, they're territorial, they're omnivorous. Um, they too are burrowing. Um, they use multiple warrens in their home ranges. They breed quickly and have one to two joeys and they live for a couple of years in the wild. So I think the first question to ask, and we can discuss this later, is, you know, is throwing in endangered species with predators ethical? And I, I would argue, yes, if done carefully, yes, in the right context, at least to ask the question, you know, can we increase the success of reintroductions? So if our reintroductions are working and animals aren't being killed, then, you know, don't do this. But if we're facing a problem and predation is that problem, the alternative of not doing anything or trying anything experimentally, scientifically, is more failed introductions and reintroductions, then that means we can't ever recover populations in the wild. Maybe that's the answer, but I think it's worth going down fighting and trying to figure out whether it is or isn't. So we um, conduct this research at a place called Arid Recovery, um, which is near Roxby Downs in South Australia. It's in the Australian arid zone. Catherine and her husband years ago um, created um, this nonprofit where they ultimately ended up putting predator-proof fence around 123 square kilometers of habitat. Um, so uh, it's divided into different paddocks or pens, and we use these different paddocks uh, to have replicate populations of, 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 of different treatments, at least, and in some cases, replicate populations of our treatments. Um, Catherine and her husband spent a lot of time designing predator-proof fence. And the key thing about the fence is it has to have a floppy top. The other key thing about the fence is you've got to constantly monitor it. You've got to constantly look for holes. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of effort into keeping an area this size uh, truly predator proof. What's fascinating about this is the largest um, uh, thing on earth, the great bingo fence runs right through the center of arid recovery. The bingo fence is compared to the fox and cat proof fence, it's just this little fence, 
but um, it keeps dingoes from crossing. And basically it's longer than the Great Wall of China. It goes through South Australia, New South Wales, up to the Queensland border. South of the dingo fence, dingoes are heavily um, controlled, killed. Um, there really aren't any dingoes. North of the dingo fence, um, there are dingoes. Now what's really interesting is dingoes naturally suppress populations of cats and foxes. <laughs> so um, dingoes are a species that came over about five, five, 5,000 years ago, essentially, to mainland Australia. And while they might have been responsible for the extinction of Tasmanian, well, what we now call Tasmanian devils, but devils on the mainland, um, other species were able to coexist with them. And burrowing bedongs and bilbies were able to coexist with, with dingoes. Um, but it really was the introduction of foxes and cats by Europeans that led to their extinction. So there's a lot of um, interesting discussion and debate about how dingoes could be used to help naturally manage um, predators. And, and ultimately, we need to understand not only if these animals can coexist with cats, but also coexist with dingoes. And, and bilbies certainly have been coexisting with dingoes because they have not been driven extinct um, on mainland Australia. What's fascinating about the dingo fence is you walk to either side of it and you see the ecological effect. I mean, it, it, it drives a trophic cascade. You see the vegetation is different. And importantly, you see, um, you start seeing small mammal prints on where dingoes are because dingoes are suppressing these other, these other introduced predators. So inside the predator proof fence, we see many mammal traps, even mammals that weren't introduced, including all sorts of um, indigenous mice and endemic mice. Um, you might think of Australia as being a continent filled with really cool marsupials, but actually there are also really cool rodents, um, including endemic rodents. So prior work by Catherine has shown that bedongs can't coexist with even a single fox. So here what we're looking at is we're looking at bedong populations and um, a single fox came in and these are track counts. And soon after the fox came in, pretty much all the bedongs went extinct. Um, and that was in um, 66 bedongs with one fox. Um, and it took a while, but eventually all the bedongs went extinct. So the question is, okay, what can be done? So the initial thing that Catherine tried was, you know, pre-release training and that didn't really work. Now it turns out that neither um, bilbies nor bedongs are entirely predator naive. And we've demonstrated this with a variety of studies. Um, Lisa Steinler's dissertation work showed that um, Bilby's capacity to discriminate predator sense scales with their period of evolutionary coexistence. So we put out smells of um, cats and canids um, compared to controls. And, you know, Bilby's had been around canids forever because, well, forever, for at least 5,000 years because dingoes um, had, had lived on um, mainland Australia. And they discriminate between um, controls and even cats and, and dog scent. We didn't have dingo scent um, when we were doing this experiment. So there's some ability to recognize um, the, the smell of predators. Many species have the ability to respond to the smell of predators. Turns out predator naive bedongs tend to look more and spend more time escaping around models of dingoes, which were a historically important predator. So here we put out food trays um, and we look at control, nothing dingo, fox, kangaroo, and you know, it's not a strong effect, but they tend to um, you know, spend more time in sight looking um, and a little more time in sight uh, escaping. Okay, let's go on. This was a, um, an honors project that was conducted in our population. Both bedongs and bilbies therefore have some ability to discriminate predators. They're not completely predator naive, which is good um, because if you're completely predator naive, um, the framework that Alex Carthy and I put together suggests that these guys would have even more problems. So the key question is, can exposure to cats increase wariness? So we um, basically started a long-term experiment. In what we call the Red Lake expansion or the Red Lake paddock, um, it's a 26 square kilometer area. Um, we basically had one cat and we put in a whole bunch of bedongs and a whole bunch of billy, bilbies and we let them live there for years. Um, and then we um, moved some animals around in our control areas just to simulate um, movement. So 
what we found, oh, and, and um, um, we measured any predator behavior um, before we moved animals, after they were living with one cat for a while, and then after we started putting more cats in um, to increase predation pressure. And we didn't really know what was gonna happen. I mean, we were really concerned that we put one cat in and one cat's gonna kill them all. Um, that didn't happen, fortunately, but we were trying, you know, we were monitoring that because we didn't want everyone to die because of the cat. Rebecca West was our postdoc working on the project for years. And, um, you know, a lot of radio tracking, a lot of work. And basically um, what we found was that um, three out of um, 10 animals died in the control area over time and nine out of 26 um, in, in, in the cat treatment, um, you know, over time. Um, but that was not significantly different. But more importantly, we found that um, bedungs and bilbies have been coexisting with cats. So if we do spotlight counts, all these animals are nocturnal. So it's pretty much all nocturnal work. You drive around, you you know, drive around, and you have a spotlight, and you look for eye shine, and then you you know write down how many you're seeing. Um, we found that um, we found you know certainly more animals in the control area than the cat area, but there were more animals in the control area. There were a lot of animals in the control area, but we found that not only were they not going extinct over time, but they actually were increasing by some measures. Bedongs and bilbies have been reproducing in the presence of cats, so a greater proportion of the animals over time in the um, cat exposed areas um, were newly, uh, were, were new young, were, were recently um, born young. So not only are they persisting, but they're able to successfully reproduce. And when we saw this, we're like, wow, this is great. We actually have coexistence with cats, which is really cool because that means that these animals can live with low densities of cats, maybe not high densities, but they can at least live with low densities. So the take home message is bedongs and bilbies can both coexist and reproduce with cats. And we sort of, um, you know, sort of putting more and more um, cats into this area, figuring out where's that, you know, threshold. So if the question is, you know, four cats um, per uh, 26 square kilometers, uh, is that a lot or a little? Well, that's actually what you have on the landscape in a lot of Australia, but you can also have higher densities. And what happens if higher densities? Well, we found that you know the, the, the population can go up, but at some point um, we start um, having you know, some issues. Does living with cats change any predator behavior? In other words, are we able to either select or allow these animals to learn themselves how to respond to predators? And we, we asked a series of questions about, you know, what do these predator naive animals know about predators as a function of historical exposure to mammalian predators? And how does living with cats change this? We found that bilbies became more cautious after living with cats. Um, it took them longer to emerge from burrows. Um, if you sort of say, well, how long does it take to emerge from a burrow from ones living with the cats versus not in a, in a controlled area? And they also spend more time in cover. Bilbies, um, as I said before, did not entirely go extinct on mainland Australia and existed and persisted with cats. Well, bedongs. As I was saying before, bedongs came from uh, some of these Western Australia barrier islands that were free of mammalian predators for at least 8,000 years. There were some exposure to humans uh, there were some pastoralists that, that ran sheep on these islands. They had these horrific things called Aboriginal lock hospitals, where basically um, they took lepers and other um, indigenous Australians and sort of locked them up on these on these islands um, and wouldn't let them leave. I'm assuming there were probably some cats and, and, and dogs associated, you know, with this, but not a lot, and not persistent populations over a long time. So what we found with bedongs is that bedongs have learned to discriminate cat models after living with cats. So we find not strong discrimination. This is the control, this is a bucket, so this is sort of nothing, but this is a, a, a bad taxidermy mount of a cat and a bad taxidermy mount of a rabbit. And we're looking at the proportion time in sight in the controls and yeah, you know, there's not a lot of discrimination, but here we're beginning to see discrimination. 
whereby those animals living with cats um, are, are uh, behaving significantly differently than those animals with rabbits or other controls. So there seems to be some discrimination uh, that, that happens over a period of years living with cats. Living with cats permits bedongs to generalize cat body odor to also discriminate Tasmanian devil body odor. So one question one can ask is how specific are these responses? In other words, are animals learning that there's a cat or can they, or they generalize this to respond to other predatory smells? And for bedongs at least, um, there seems to be good evidence that they're responding to predatory smells, which is really promising. Bedongs have become more wary over time when living with cats. So we figured out a way to look at flight initiation distance, something I've spent a lot of time studying in a lot of different species, where we approach animals at night and see how close we can get to them. And um, over time, we see we can't get as close to them. Turns out bedongs living with cats have become more docile over time if we sort of look at when we catch them and release them, how docile they are. They're not as stressy in some sense, but that actually is quite interesting. What about bilbies? Well, we selected um, a handful of well, 24 bilbies from the predator free population and 23 predator exposed bilbies. They've been uh, living with cats for at least for two years and we put them into an area with 10 cats and we said, how long can they survive? And bilbies, we radio track them and we found that the predator exposed ones survived initially significantly longer than did the predator free ones. That's really promising because it, um, it, it suggests that the crunch time in a lot of these reintroductions is right after you put these animals out. And over a month and a half almost, um, the predator exposed ones survived longer. So this seems to suggest that we couldn't follow them longer because of the way we taped um, transmitters to their tails, um, we, uh, the, they would fall off over time. So, but initially at least, this is really promising. Does it work for bedongs? Well, we did two releases. Um, in release one, we took 20 from the predator free and 19 from the predator conditioned. We had a relatively high cat density and we did it at another time. Um, we did 25 and 25 with a relatively low cat density. And we monitored survival over, uh, in, in one case, a longer period of time um, with collars that we could you know, keep on the animals for longer than we could with the bilbies. And what we found was at the low cat densities or the high cat densities, we found no significant differences in survival as a function of living with predators or not living with predators. In the high cat density, um, they pretty much went extinct pretty quickly. In the low cat density, they really, they, they persisted for a while, but then both populations um, with prior experience um, went extinct pretty quickly. The high cat density was done sort of at the beginning of a drought. The low cat density was done after a drought had been going on for a while. And um, either way, it's not showing that prior exposure to cats increases exposure, increases survival when bedongs are put in an area with cats. So it's sort of the complete opposite response we found with bilbies. Interestingly, in that second release, larger animals had a reduced risk of mortality. Now, what was interesting was in that second release, they survived um, longer initially, right? Um, what Catherine studies, among other things, Catherine, I think, is one of the most innovative conservation scientists out there. and. She not only studies the prey, but she also puts a lot of effort into studying cats and the predators and how they act and how they respond to various stimuli. And one thing she notices is that not all cats are, are, are predators for bedongs or bilbies. Um, there's individual variation in the propensity and ability of cats to begin targeting bedong and bilby sized animals. So it's possible that one cat um, became a bedong killer over this time and then realized, well, bedongs are social, they're clumped, and I can take them out, you know, rather quickly. So ultimately, we're working towards evaluating this not inside the fence, but outside the fence. So um, 
we have really good collaborators with Bush Heritage Australia, and there's a, 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 a site they have called Bon Bon Nature Reserve, and it's a large conservation reserve. And they are in the process of removing all of the foxes via baiting. Foxes take baits. So if you aerially drop poison, um, the foxes will pick up those baits and, and, and ultimately die. And they're trying to dramatically reduce cat population size by going out and trapping and, and shooting cats. Again, we can talk about the ethics of this you know, in our discussion, um, but I think the context of Australia when trying to maintain our indigenous endemic species um, is something at least worth discussing. In addition, um, Catherine and her husband are designing baits that might work for cats. Um, they have something called the Felixer, which um, is really interesting in that it sort of capitalizes on how cats see the world. So cats are attracted by a smell up to um, a station, which has a camera, which has some really good AI running in the background, which recognizes cats. And if it sees a cat, it will squirt out some gooey poison and the cats will groom it off. And it seems to work really well. It's pretty expensive right now to deploy these things and manufacture these things, but this could be a way to control cats in a local area. So we've not been able to get the cat population or the fox population down to a level that we're happy with to put animals outside in Bon Bon, but ultimately we're gonna be putting um, cat exposed and non-cat exposed um, animals in Bon Bon. So I've made this on, on sort of the shorter side so we can discuss these ideas because I think this is really worth discussing. If you hadn't thought about some of these ideas before, um, you might think they're a little shocking. It really makes us think about, you know, what are we trying to conserve and what is our what are our intentions of conservation? And I think that's something we should really think about. But together, I think these results show that bedhogs and bilbies have some ability to respond to predators. It appears to scale with evolutionary experience, but the fact they have some ability means that maybe we can turn that ability up. That's a good thing. They're not completely predator naive. That we demonstrated um, much to our both surprise and happiness that um, it's possible to have these species coexist with some predators. We didn't know if that was possible. It is possible. That completely rechanges the conservation target to what are the coexistence thresholds that uh, of, of predators and prey that allow a population to persist with predators. Now, Australia is really interesting. We've been experiencing a multi-year drought there, which has almost eradicated um, the animals in arid recovery. It's been horrible. That's killing animals all over Australia. I mean, it hasn't rained for years in many places. And the coexistence thresholds are really ecological questions. So it's not simply how many predators can animals coexist with, it's how many prey are there? Are there alternative prey? Um, what are the density of alternative prey? What are the density of the species you're interested in? And, and where in the drought cycle are you? So it's gonna take many more years to sort of identify what these coexistence thresholds are. But I think we've shown that at least for cats, which have been implicated in extinction of many species, you know, we got a coexistence threshold. And if foxes can be brought down um, through poisoning, um, maybe, you know, we can have coexistence in the wild. But the ecology of this is a really compelling question. And that's, I think, where one of the places we're going right now with our own work. Living with cats increases any predator abilities and wariness for at least some species. Um, what explains variation in the effect between species? We don't know. Um, we know that bedongs are very social and bilbies aren't that social. And maybe that's part of it. Um, we can't do the exact same experiments with both species because if we put bait out um, and they're bedongs in an area, they're gonna find the bait and eat the bait. So we can't study bilbies in the same way we study bedongs. Bedongs displace bilbies. Does this better prepare animals for life outside the fence? Well, we know inside the fence, bilbies kind of do better as a function of this training. Bedongs didn't, um, but maybe we can, you know, explore this outside the fence as well. And again, um, when we have sufficient 
animals and when we have predators controlled to a level that we're comfortable with, because what we don't want is to put these animals out and have them all die, um, we'll experiment with that and, and see if this can work. This is gonna work for all species. As I said at the beginning, if you've got five left of something on earth um, or 10 or even 100, you're probably not gonna wanna expose them to predators. But it might work if you've got large populations of things and it might be a tool that becomes increasingly important if you're bringing animals into predator-free fenced reserves. Can this work more naturally? Again, the ecology of this, um, there's a lot of politics behind this, but you know, dingoes naturally control foxes. So maybe this could work in places north of the dingo fence, but maybe not south of the dingo fence. Um, Bonbon is north of the dingo fence. And I would like to acknowledge the support from Rebecca West and Hannah Bannister and a bunch of PhD students, Alexander Ross, Eleanor Saxon Mills, Lisa Steindler, a bunch of uh, honor students, Rosemary Atkins, Matt Hyatt, for all sorts of assistance on this um, in, in a variety of these studies. Arid Recovery is this amazing nonprofit and we can only do the work through our close collaboration um, with them. And they have lots of staff and volunteers that have helped support us in numerable ways. Um, the local communities have also helped us out quite a bit. And uh, of course, the Australian Research Council um, provided funding for all of this research and we're um, indebted to their work. And they've entrusted us with a third round of funding that we hope to continue to learn more from um, this amazing experiment and, and, and really hopefully increase um, the success of animals living outside the fence and hopefully we'll be able to restore populations outside the fence. So with that, I would love to try to um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I'm open for discussion. And if you wanna have a policy statement, I mean, let's make it a discussion. It doesn't have to be a question. Um, you know, I'm welcome to, to that as well. Um, I'll cast some of what I'm doing in the context of what you might heard, have heard of before as compassionate conservation. Compassionate conservation is I think doing conservation better and it's trying to minimize harm and suffering um, on individuals. And it's trying to ultimately increase the success of conservation. And I think that, and I think Catherine and um, Mike Letnick and I think very strongly that this is compassionate conservation. Hardcore compassionate conservations would disagree. And they would say anytime animals are being hurt or killed, um, you know, that's not, that's not compassionate. And we can discuss that if you want to discuss that as well, particularly in the context of the Australian uh, context. So thanks for coming and thanks for listening and thanks for your time. And let's turn this into a discussion. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Blumstein for your very interesting talk. So um, I'm now monitoring the chat on YouTube. And also, um, yeah, just to uh, re-emphasize that um, we would really love to have the discussion. So there's still time for you to join our Zoom session. Just um, message us on social media. Uh, we posted the our Facebook page name, so uh, you can get the Zoom link, or you could, yeah, email us or whatever. So, um, well, I have one question here on Zoom. How do you think this could be applied to other habitats? So I think the so I think it could be applied to other habitats. I think it's the species that's the issue. Um, if you're trying to reintroduce animals into the wild to recover a population, um, and reintroduction means you have in captivity. If you've got a large captive population and ideally multiple large captive populations, and maybe you have a reservoir other population, I think that it's and and, and that pr prior experience reintroducing animals into the wild has failed then maybe this can work and it's worth trying. If you can take animals from captivity and put them in the wild and they succeed, don't do this. If you can take animals from one wild location and supplement another population with what's called a translocation and it succeeds, don't do it. But we're dealing with the failures. Um, colleague of mine, several colleagues of mine um, work with very endangered birds in Hawaii and um, you know, they're being driven extinct by predators and they've been doing all sorts of things, but the populations are just, they're, they're, they're too few of them in captivity to do stuff like this. So they have to worry about every single individual. 
Um, but in theory, it could work with other um, populations where um, predation is a limiting factor of reintroduction or conservation success. And therefore, um, this could be a potential way to increase that. And, you know, I'm completely agnostic about whether it works or doesn't work. It worked for one of our species seemingly, didn't work for the other. I think what we need to do is we need to say, well, if we're sort of, if we want not run out of options, can this work? Under what circumstances will it work? I think the bilbies are more solitary and I think the bedongs just attract predators. So I think that if anything, because they're social, the predators go, great, I've decided to focus on bedongs now. Now I know where they all are. And maybe they're outgunned in terms of not having a, a good response. Did a lot, I've done a lot of work with tamar wallabies in the past. And one of the main things that all of these macrocoded marsupials do is they foot stomp when they see a predator. Um, it's an alarm signal and it may be directed to the predator. So imagine evolving where you evolved an alarm signal to tell a predator to piss off and then you've got a fox that doesn't speak that language. Um, so the, you know, the bedongs jumping up and down and foot stomping and saying, go away, go away, go away. And the predator's like, my meal, you're, you're calling me in. So, I mean, there may be a mismatch in how they respond to these things as well. Um, that you can't necessarily train that as easily as you can train discrimination. But the idea is by letting things sort themselves out of in this in situ way that that may work. But they still might be outgunned in some sense. And, um, you know, they might not have the proper abilities. Thank you. Um, so one more question on Zoom. Do you think that uh, the eradication of cats is a useful strategy considering that domestic cats provide a pool to replenish feral cat populations? Yeah, you know, cats are a real problem because we keep them as pets and, you know, we like them. I mean, if you have a cat, please keep it indoors. Um, and I think, you know, it's really about what do we value as society. And if we value our cats going outside, then we're going to have problems with, you know, um, animals. Um, and when you have an entirely ende endemic fauna that doesn't have a lot of great, you know, clearly isn't able to coexist with as many cats as there are in, running around Australia, that can be a problem. Um, and then the joint effect of cats and foxes, that's a problem. Um, I would hope that we could work towards an area where sections of Australia, maybe not all of it, Western Australia is half the continent. The poison used to kill foxes is a horrible poison that is illegal in many countries. Um, however, the plants produce that phytochemical as a defensive compound. And in Western Australia, animal native animals aren't killed by it so there's resistance problem is as you keep using it so you can take airplanes and just dump poison out and you're going to kill the foxes but you're not going to kill the native animals that's really good um, if you want to get rid of foxes but not native animals of course this is selecting for resistance in foxes and that's going to come across at some point but through multiple techniques i can envision a future australia where sections of it um, might be either predator free or have massively lower predator densities. And in that case, um, I can imagine there might still be some cats there, but maybe um, you know we can solve that problem and animals might be able to coexist with low densities of cats. It's an uphill battle if people keep wanting to have their cats outside. Um, you know, what I'm learning from COVID is that I mean, this is a no brainer. We know exactly what needs to be done with COVID, right? You wear a mask, you physically isolate, um, you respect other people. Um, these are not science. And, and then you, you know, work for a vaccine. Um, you test and trace and isolate. Um, the, 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 the how to deal with pandemic threat is rather easy. Um, how to deal with human responses to this is really the challenge. And this is like a complete wake up call for how we're gonna deal with climate change. Um, or how we're going to deal with the culture of people that want their cats to be outside. Nothing wrong with having a cat, keep it inside, please. Even in North America, even in Britain, even in Europe, cats eat a lot of wild animals um, and they have an impact on populations. And 
one of my colleagues, um, Gerardo uh, Sabalas at UNAM in Mexico, you know, has been depressing me more and more with every one of his papers, because it's not simply that species are going extinct, it's that vertebrate populations across the globe are massively, massively, massively declining. So what we're looking at is we're looking at impending extinctions in the next 50 or 100 years. So extinction isn't the only thing you want to be looking at. You want to be looking at vertebrate population health. And, you know, between toxification and overharvesting and fragmentation and, and, and feral animals, um, you know, we're destroying biodiversity. And if we value biodiversity as society, we'll do things to change our behavior. If we don't, proof's in the pudding. Clearly in, 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 in the US, we value bars more than we value kids going to school. I think, I don't care about college students. I care about K through six, K through eight, maybe even K through 12, kids being in school. Um, we're destroying a whole generation of women. We're destroying a whole generation of professional people that end up taking care of their kids. The, 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 the non-target costs of kids staying home are profound and we have it in our control to fix that. Uh, we clearly don't want to. And that to me is very depressing. Um, but conservation problems are human behavioral problems. Uh, our perceptions are human behavioral perceptions. And we're only going to solve these um, through human behavioral management, which I think is a, a massive frontier um, in conservation that we need to advance rapidly and urgently. And just a question from myself, a uh, follow-up question. So how how much communication is there between your you and your colleagues and the, the government, let's say? Well, um, of, yeah, pushing. We, work with, we work with both non-governmental non, non organizations and we work under the permits issued by the South Australian government, ethics permits, et cetera. Um, everyone knows Catherine and and, and everyone knows this project. We were just nominated for a, a big prize. We're a finalist for a big prize that we'll hear about next week. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, people are paying attention. Um, people are following this. People are, we're, we're, get, we're grasping at straws. We're trying to improve toolkits and share toolkits and we're being very transparent with, with what we're doing. Um, it can work for it may work for some species it may not work for others um i think it's worth worth trying but we're definitely connected with both government and non-governmental organizations that are involved in conservation um, and community organizations that are involved in conservation as well thank you um so one follow-up question um oh okay sorry like um um, so, okay, there's one question on Zoom. As you say, naive prey can learn to respond to predators. I was wondering if the reverse could be done. Could prey previously exposed to predators to be trained to unlearn their association? If one were interested in the extent of brain plasticity and how this enables learning, would this be a good method to investigate that? So my, some colleagues in, in Sydney and New Zealand are doing really fascinating <coughs> experiments. Um, <coughs> basically, rats eat lots of ground nesting bird eggs and even non ground nesting bird eggs. And there's a series of studies that show if you um, put, um, how are they doing this? They're basically training the rats um, to not find bird nests profitable by putting bird scent out there, but it's not rewarded by um, eggs. And it works in Sydney, and now it's working in New Zealand, and there are a number of, uh, of studies coming out. Google Catherine Price. Um, she's the one involved in all of these studies. Um, uh, she's been working with Peter Banks. So for her dissertation, she did the work in in Sydney, but now she, she and Peter are working with us uh, with in New Zealand as well. And they're doing it on a landscape level where they're actually going out and training predators that certain cues normally associated with prey are not predictive of food. Um, I think that's really innovative conservation. Um, the fact that it's working in the field is extremely cool. Um, and I think more people need to try that, you know, in certain areas where this could work. 
The problem is, and this is always the problem, I've done a lot of stuff trying to create artificial dingo urine. Turns out um, a lot of animals don't like dingo urine for whatever reason. It's different than canid, other canid urine. And um, in Australia, it's really repellent. So we've been trying to you know, make artificial dingo urine and find the essence. Smells are really difficult to work with. Um, a smell is much more like perfume than it is like a physical stimulus, right? You know, so we know that two eyes and expanding images um, scare animals, but what is it about a smell? It's not, it's in some cases, for some species, it is a key chemical. Um, TMT is in fox feces and fox fur. PEA is a chemical in felid um, urine um, that seems to have lead to an innate um, anti-predator response in rats um, and some other species. So in some cases it is one chemical, but in other cases it's really a mix of the right chemicals. In any event, in Australia, um, there's a lot of pressure to come up with um, less invasive predator control. When miners go in and mine an area, they're required to revegetate areas. And when they're revegetating areas, they have to prevent whatever endemic fauna there are from eating the freshly planted vegetation. So this can easily be done by putting fences out, um, but more, but that's very expensive. So um, trying to figure out ways to deter them through fear um, is, is worth trying. Um, this could work um, if animals, if predators have an option. So if you're mining in, a, in, a, in an area where there's a lot of vegetation and there are other patches and you have one mined patch and then you plant this, even though there's fresh growth, it might not be well defended with you know, phytochemicals. Um, you know, if there's other places for the animals to eat, you can probably, you might be able to tip them over the edge and make a patch less attractive. But in Red Earth Australia, in Arizona Australia, where a lot of mining is going on, I mean, what you're trying to do is you're trying to put like one plant here and another plant over there, and that's considered revegetation because the densities, you know, are really low. Life is about decisions. Life is about choosing between this patch and another patch. And if there really isn't any other patch to go to, I suspect that some of these deterrents aren't going to work. So the ecological context is going to also be really important in terms of figuring out where these sorts of things, you know, have a chance of working. Um, yeah, speaking of the method that you just described, um, I think in, in psychology, it's called extinction. So you keep on providing the stimulus, but um, not providing the reward. So um, like over time, the positive association formed in the, in the animal or like the subject would uh, start to the de decrease. Um, so I think, yeah, that's that's actually a really smart way. Um, and well, because I, I do a bit of psychology. So um, I think there's another way, maybe you could even introduce uh, um, negative association between the stimulus, for example, the scent of the predator or, or like a scent of the prey with a negative stimulus, for example. Uh, an electric shock, so that might actually deter the predator from um, the searching for, like for example, the rat um, searching for. Absolutely, the challenge, and this is the challenge that you know cognitive mechanisms evolved. Um, what we see is the result of adaptation. The biases animals have maybe towards taking ec extra risks to you know get food. Um, we have to put this in the, in the realm of the ecological trade-offs they're making. So if there are other things for them to eat, if you have a generalist, so if you have a specialist that specializes on eggs, um, and that can be at an individual level, um, it, might be a, it might be harder. If you have a generalist or you're trying to prevent specialization on eggs, that might be easier. Um, so it really depends on what the natural range of phenotypic plasticity and diets are. Um, ecologically, are there other things for animals to eat? And, you know, and then thinking about that in, in, in light of, you know, other conservation issues as well. Ultimately, we want to restore communities. So it could work really well to save your one species of nesting bird from predators, but if they eat something else to extinction, that's not so good either. So, um, you know, playing around with cognitive tools um, and capitalizing on various biases, I think is really exciting. Um, behavior and, 
and behavioral mechanisms are levers that we have to manipulate behavior and thinking about this from a very mechanistic basis is really what I think of the essence of conservation behavior. So being cross-trained in psychology gives you know, us a whole new toolkit to potentially apply to create really innovative conservation solutions. So, I mean, I think you're spot on. Thank you. We actually have quite a few questions on Zoom and there's also one on YouTube. So um, I'm just going to read the next question. Oh, sure, if you want. I'm happy talking. Okay. Um, so the next question from Kirsty on Zoom. Um, you show that bilbies took longer to emerge and spent more time in cover when living with cats. Have any impacts of this on fitness been investigated, for example, as a result of possibly less time spent foraging? No, um, we haven't. Um, you know, so we're getting indications that they're able to detect and they're changing their behavior as a function of this manipulation. Um, we aren't able to drill down and look at, um, Billy's a hard to study. Um, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty flighty to begin with. Um, <laughs> we catch them by running them down actually, um, because if we put out traps and try to catch the bilbies, typically bedongs go in them. So then we have to spotlight bilbies and chase them with nets. Um, but um, because we've had lots of bedongs, the bedongs interfere with a lot of our bilby work. Um, so, you know, we have indications that are suggestive, that are consistent, that are showing that they're changing their behavior as a function of this treatment. And I'll, I'm the first to say the treatment's not replicated. Um, you know, we put all our eggs in one large basket and looking at it over time. Um, there are, for bedongs, there's something else that's co varying in these two sites, and that's density, um, but not for bilbies really. Um, so, no, we haven't looked at more other consequences of this. Um, however, during this time, bilby populations were going up with cats. So, we figured that's that's what we really care about. Thank you. Um, so that's one question from YouTube. Um, would an increase in the variation of predators in the environment, for example, phenotypically scent, um, etc., limit the efficacy of this technique? So putting predator scents into the environment artificially, will that limit it? Uh, I think so, yeah. I don't know. I think you'd have to think about what you're doing in a given context. So why would you want to put predator sense in? So if you're trying to keep animals away, yeah, you know, the animals that you're trying to recover might run away. Um, so that wouldn't be good. Um, it also, however, could be used to keep their wariness up. Maybe you're trying to make sure they encounter predators in particular frequencies. So if animals aren't encountering predators, maybe they let their guard down. So if we move from the dangerous inner city to suburbia, you know, how long does it take us to relax? How long does it take us to, you know, not keep a light on our porch at night? How long does it take us to not lock our doors? Um, you know, so if we're putting animals into areas where we reduce predator um, density, but we still want them to retain some wariness of predators, maybe it could be important to, you know, give them those scents um, just to keep them wary. Maybe it would be important to, you know, have real predators interact with them periodically to keep that going. So given that what we're trying to do is create populations that can live outside a fence, or more and more to figure out densities inside a fence whereby you don't lose anti-predator behavior and you maintain abilities that could be used outside a fence, you know, maybe predator scents are going to be part of that and maybe real predators are going to be part of that as well. It depends on the species. Good question. And by the way, those are the sorts of questions that you want to be asking when you're thinking about um, sort of creative conservation interventions. Um, I'm involved in something we call the Conservation um, Toolkit Project, where we're getting a lot of people, including people um, you know, from the UK, but really all over the world, um, to try to create a series of resources that can expand all of our toolkits. Um, you know, what's known, I want to learn something about, you know, how do I design a survey to um, ask people's attitudes towards something? 
how do I get that information in a concise way? Um, what are neglected areas of conservation, frankly, like conservation behavior? How can we get those ideas out there in an easily digestible open source way whereby anyone has access to evidence and tools and that can be used to sort of create discussions. So a lot of when I think about a conservation problem, you're faced with the problem and then you don't want to just use old tools because you have them. You want to say, well, what tools could be used for a problem? You know, is putting predator sense out there a potentially useful thing or not useful thing? Let's think about it. So developing checklists and saying, here's my toolkit, um, that's what we're trying to do. Come up with a, a greater toolkit that can be used in discussions before conservation actions happen so that we improve the outcome of conservation actions. Um, okay, so um, now I'm um, still monitoring the live chat on YouTube. Um, and for people on Zoom, feel free to unmute if you have any questions or just um, any comments. Um, in terms of the toolkit, so uh, if I understand, understand correctly, it's already online. No, um, we're building it, we're designing it as we speak. Okay, okay, so it's work it's in fun. progress. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, this, this I, does I sound... Question. Sorry? Sorry, if you don't mind, I'll ask a question. Mm -hmm, yeah, sure. Yeah, so like, um, so like in, in the media nowadays, there's like a lot of like um, conservation kind of, uh, let's say, pub, uh, like being a lot more uh, it's portrayed a lot, but sometimes it can be kind of bombarding on like, let's say a normal audience. So what tips would you have to like effectively communicate the, the need and the solutions that we actually have? Because sometimes I feel like people are pushed away because there's just too much coming at them and none of it's actually, you know, penetrating. And... I don't know. I think that's the million dollar question. I think the human behavioral sciences aspect of this is what we need to be focusing on. Um, I think we know in many cases, in some cases, we know what needs to be done. Um, we know that we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but we're not really, um, right? Um, I just wrote a book, um, The Nature of Fear, you know, survival lessons from the wild. Um, you know, when does fear work? When doesn't it work? Fear works as a motivator when the causality is obvious when the link of your action and an outcome is obvious that, um, you know, when your outcome has an action, um, when your action has an outcome, um, if it's too diffuse, I mean, we can stop using all CO2 today and we're still gonna have burned in, um, you know, increased, um, increased, uh, 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 you know, climate change, increased temperature, global heating. Um, we don't have an ethics to deal with intergenerational conflicts like this. Um, the causality is really difficult. One of the one of the most successful conservation interventions was um, was uh, uh, CFCs, the the coolant, um, and in part, it was discovered that this was that the CFCs were creating an ozone hole and that someone actually turns out incorrectly reported that sheep in Patagonia, Southern Argentina were going blind, Southern Argentina and Chile were going blind because of the ozone hole and everyone got you know, fearful. Disgust is a powerful motivator. So disgust can be used to leverage you know, fear. And um, very quickly, the Montreal Protocol came into effect and very quickly um, CFCs were banned and taken out of circulation um, pretty effectively, um, allowing the ozone hole to recover. COVID is one of those cases where everything's set up um, to work, except context. Um, you guys, you know, if you're younger, have a reduced risk of bad side effects than I have. Um, context is everything. Personal risk is everything. Now, as a society, we clearly don't care about our elders um, because if we did, you know, we wouldn't be going to bars and parties and, 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 and maintaining spread. And we also don't care about our school kids because if we did, we would just close down bars and you know not and, and and you know shut people down for a while. It's 
amazing to talk to my colleagues in Australia. In Western Australia, they've just shut down half a continent and everyone goes about living their normal lives. In South Australia, um, they haven't shut down the whole state, but they have pretty good restrictions and good quarantines. And it's not like the whole world is going to South Australia, but whoever's there more or less does whatever they want. I mean, it's amazing. They're living through a pandemic as though it's not an issue because it isn't because they acted hard early on and saved things. And New Zealand successfully, you know, been able to close things down and the US is a shit storm um, as are other countries. So I think how you use fear, how you leverage fear, how you prevent people from being fatigued. So we're all going through, um, you know, COVID fatigue right now. This is behavioral sciences, how you market things. I'm right. I'm trying to sell an op-ed now. It keeps getting rejected um, where a colleague and I are talking about gamifying things. Wouldn't it be great if um, you make cities compete like the Olympics? I mean, so insider outsider conflict is one of these human biases. How can we capitalize on these biases? These biases are evolved. They evolved for a reason, right? Um, how can we capitalize on these biases to create friendly competitions? Wouldn't it be great? I mean, like think Eurovision on steroids, Eurovision with, the ben with benefits. Um, you know, instead of having the dumbest song, you have the, sorry if I'm offending any Eurovision fans, you know, you have um, the, the city or the country that can reduce its carbon proportionally the most or reduce COVID transmission proportionally the most. We love to compete. Um, we love to pitch ourselves against others. Um, I think the, the failure of science, certainly in the US, and the complete loss of respect of science, certainly in the US, is terrifying. You know, there are facts out there. I study any predator behavior. I've written op-eds on this. You know, animals that pretend there's no risk and find themselves dead. And you have, you know, a continent full of Americans finding themselves dead now. In the paper today, I read that people are, you know, having their last breaths thinking that COVID's still a farce and they're dying from COVID. Now that's screwed. So if we can't agree on, you know, base rules, evidence, science, I think are some of those base rules. What you do with it policy-wise, debate that. But the evidence and science are base rules. If you can't agree with that, I mean, I think we're doomed. And I think um, what I'm seeing with what we're doing with COVID dooms us for dealing with some of these biodiversity things. But I do have hope that leveraging biases, leveraging emotions might be able to, um, and I'm, I'm working on this right now, you know, figure out ways to, to, to do that. But I don't have the answer. I mean, that's the million dollar question. Yeah, thank you for that. That was a very, very insightful bit on how today's behavioral scientists could be tomorrow's conservationists, which is really, really cool. Um, also, uh, another thing is very hypothetical. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but do you think that lockdowns, uh, so we've heard all the, the fake news about lockdowns actually uh, reviving animal populations. We've had all those images and stuff. But do you actually think that um, the fact that a lot of people like you, conservationists, who could who could have been doing their research and actually saving potentially a lot more animals, um, not doing their work might actually be harming us more than all of us not being outside? The, the you know, so <laughs> I guess I'm being recorded, but I'm going to say it. You know, Trump is right. Um, you know, never thought you'd hear me say that. Um, you know, you can't just shut down an economy. You can't just lock people in forever. Um, and there's a huge trade-off in this. Um, you know, what we're doing now is we're doing an uncontrolled failed attempt at herd immunity that's gonna kill many more people because hospitals get overwhelmed. Um, we're certainly doing that in the US. Um, ultimately, people are gonna to have to get immunity either through getting it um, or through a vaccine. Um, lockdowns have costs. Lockdowns have huge societal costs. Um, we don't have a social safety net in the US. Um, many European countries have a social safety net. Um, we don't have 
ways to, I mean, when I said uh, we have a generation of women, particularly professional women, who are being screwed right now because they end up getting taken care of their kids. Um, that's not fair. That's not right. That, 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 that's a huge cost. We have kids in schools where the discrepancies based on income and race, ethnicity are being exacerbated because kids can't go to schools. I see that at UCLA, which is a very diverse campus. And, you know, we have lots of first generation students. And a lot of these people come from poor homes and don't pay um, tuition and get, you know, subsidies, which is great. That's how you diversify um, the world. That's how you diversify, um, you know, uh, people in all sorts of fields. That's something I viscerally believe in, increasing diversity in the workforce. Um, but these are the people that are suffering even more. Um, it's not fair. So unless you have ways of dealing with that stuff, there's this really interesting political trade-off. I don't think in the US at least we're doing it right, um, but the trade-off is that you can't just lock people down and expect, you know, forever. You have to, you know, work efficiently and inefficient um, conservation or COVID management strategies just create more problems. I mean, it's sort of like going out and you have some invasive species and you just go out and shoot them every weekend. You know, that's not doing anything. I don't even know if that's ethical. Um, if you have a plan in an area to try to eliminate something, that's different. Um, you know, but then you have to have a plan. But just going out and killing some invasive species for the hell of it, you know, you're not going to get rid of it. Um, so I think, you know, these are policy decisions and policy decisions and at least democracies are a function of what people want. And um, I'm sort of distressed by what people want. I'm, I'm always a good buzzkill of these sorts of discussions because uh, I don't think we're, the deltas are not going in the right directions and everything we're learning from COVID is just showing how hard this is. I mean, suicide rates are going up, drug addiction rates are going up, um, you know, in, in places where people are being restricted and losing their jobs. I mean, the fact that people are losing their jobs and losing their homes because there's no social safety net is, a, is appalling. It's appalling. And so I have one more question on Zoom. Um, it's slightly long. I did send it to you um, if you want to read it, but uh, I'll just read it out. So um, the question is about uh, your earlier work on the sound of fear. You say yeah, sounds... Read, read. Oh, I want to ask a question about your earlier work on the sound of fear. You said sounds trigger fear show high universality across animals, which makes sense as it's related to any predator behavior and hence likely strongly selected for. Um, however, for emotions like joy and sadness, oh, this is a great question, which do not have an immediate survival link, you think they will be less unified between species and studying them from an evolutionary approach will be less successful. So first of all, I think that our emotions evolved. Um, I do not think that, I, I, and, and some emotions are more basal than others. I'm not going to assert that other species have schadenfreude, right? But I will um, assert that, you know, pretty much all species have fear. So I think fear is sort of the low hanging fruit that I've, I've, I've studied. I don't know what the sound of joy looks like. I mean, giggling. Um, often these are sounds that are, you know, and other species laugh and giggle, but a lot of these other more cooperative fun sounds aren't, la aren't loud. Um, they're not trying to call attention to themselves. What's the sound of sadness? I mean, depression is about, you know, going in, it's about not saying anything. So I think I know what the sound of fear is. I don't know what the sound of sadness is. Having said that, I've done stuff with music and films and creating experiments with music and trying to make marmot inspired music. Um, and I don't know why I cry when those violins come in on, you know, movies. Um, I do know why I respond to, you know, the sound of fearful sounds, screams and noisy sounds. Um, so I think there's room for that. Um, but if anything, Sometimes the emotional response is to make yourself less, not to evoke responses in some sense, which is really what depression and sadness are really about, I think. So that makes it harder to study. I don't know if that answers your question. But I do think a, a first approximation is to not just think that we're hatched with our emotions, but rather, you know, emotions and cognitive abilities are an evolutionary legacy. Um, 
I just finished reading a friend's book, reviewing a friend's book, a colleague's book, um, where he sort of looks at approaching this for international relations, Dominic Johnson's uh, recent book. And um, he sort of thinks about a lot of these cognitive biases, um, overestimating risk, um, in-group, out-group, um, the, the, the fundamental attribution error as, as biases that evolve to make us safe. So if you go to the cognitive bias codex, Google it, it's pretty cool. Um, if you go to the cognitive bias codex, um, I wonder how many of those actually can be interpreted through a security decision-making framework. I need to sit down and look at that one of these days and think about that. Um, so students and I are doing that now, but I need to do it myself. Um, but I think that understanding how and why our emotions evolve is really interesting. And I acknowledge that humans are unique in many ways, and I don't think another species has stronger Freud. Um, so thank you. Um, I think if we don't have any more questions, um, we'll bring this to an end. So um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Blumstein, for your for being very generous with your time um, and sharing your insights and opinions um, and your experience as well. So um, thank you all to um, people who are joining us on Zoom and as uh, on YouTube as well. So. Um, I'll wish you all a good evening, a good day, if you are somewhere else in the world. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, everybody. Thanks for coming.